Well, I'm Peter Michael Solstead. I was born on 31 July 1945 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Birth date again, please. 31 July 1945. And Minneapolis. Yes, sir. Tell me about your family, your parents and your siblings, when you were growing up. It was a great blessing in my life to have my mother and father and my two brothers. We grew up in uh, St. Louis Park, Minnesota. From 1945 to 1953, I lived there. Then I went to California, uh, Santa Ana for one year. Then we returned to Minnesota to a western suburb of St. Louis Park, Minneapolis called Mound, Minnesota. I went to high school, and from there, the University of Minnesota. Yeah. Tell me about the high school you graduated. When did you graduate, and what was the high school? It was Mound High School, and it was in 1963. 1963? Yes. You graduated? I did. Yeah. And then you went to Minnesota University? That autumn, I went to the University of Minnesota and I graduated from there with a bachelor's degree in liberal arts, a major in history, a minor in military science, and the graduation took place on 8 June 1968. Wow, history? No, <laughs> just interested. What was your major uh, focus, interest <laughs> in history? Uh, the Far East. Far East? Mm-hmm. China and uh, Japan. China and Japan, not Korea. Korea was shunted off to the side. So tell me about what you saw about in uh, Asia history, China, Japan. Well, I, I was I was fascinated. Uh, I started with China. At one time, I could uh, repeat uh, in a sort of a high school sense all of the dynasties. And then all all of the uh, ruling families are shogunates in Japan, and I I did see and hear about Korea, but you know Korea came under Japanese hegemony around 1895, 1900, sometime around that time, and I was aware of that. So I I do a lot of reading. I I average about 10,000 pages a year. Do you see major difference between China and Japan in terms of political system and culture? Yes. You mentioned about shogunate and the dynasty in China. Well, well, what we have today in China is just a new dynasty. Right. You know, and uh, in Japan, I don't think Japan has changed much. I think General MacArthur did them a big favor. But, uh, you know, when you get deeper into society, the Japanese are still Japanese. And I don't have any problem with that. My my interest in the Far East though is Korea. How come you didn't study about it? You focused on China and Japan. Now you are interested in Korea. Well, when I when I was ordered to active duty, an unusual. Was it? Well, I was ordered to active duty on uh, 28 August 1968, mm -hmm. and it was unusual because the orders that uh, ordered me to active duty also included my ultimate assignment, which was Korea. Well, I went to ROTC, the University of Minnesota. So I was commissioned on 8 June 1968 as a second lieutenant, and I was detailed to the U.S. Army Signal Corps. Signal Corps. And that's where I stayed. And then you were called to duty on August 22nd? 28. 28. August 28. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you were assigned to Korea? Yes. I got to, oh, before I left for Korea, I was handed the CIA area study book. Yeah, what did you find? I found that it could have been written by a central committee. It didn't tell me too much about Korean people. So were you excited or what was your feeling that you are going to a country? Well, I was happy for two reasons. I, I, I always, when I was young, I used to read Terry and the Pirates, and we and they always talked about the inscrutable Oriental, and I was always charmed by them. And then we had a, a family of 11 girls uh, move into Minnesota from China, uh -huh. 
long before I was born, but one of my neighbors was a Mrs. Grace Hum. She started a company called Marvel Chow Mein. Marvel Chow Mein was sold to Chung King for $1 million in 1960. Well, Marvel was my neighbor, and when I was a little teeny boy, about six years old, one day I happened to go outside, and here was this woman standing in a, in a traditional Chinese costume, uh, made up. She was young, I suppose, about 23, four years old. But I had never seen anything more beautiful in my life. I mean, it was, it was, she was just a beauty. And I'm a little six-year-old boy, and I just sat there with my jaw on the ground. And then I found out her name was Grace Hum, and her sister was Marvel, and they're the, the ones that started this big company, which was eventually ended up as part of International Multifoods. So you were facing a new standard of beauty then? Oh, yes. Asian beauty. Yes. How do you differentiate between Western standard and Asian? It's more conservative, I would say, in Asia, even now. I mean, you, when you go to Tokyo and Seoul, it's probably not that way, or you see smatterings. But when you're around the people, you, and the Koreans are still Koreans, a homogenous people, one language, they think alike. And once you get them going in one direction, it's a force to be reckoned with. And I think the same is true in Japan and China. So can you tell the difference by yes. looking at yes. Chinese, Japanese, yes. and Korean? Yes. By appearance? Some of it is appearance, yes. Almost all of it. I mean, uh, without being crass, Korean women have no hair in their legs or arms. And Korean men are, by and large, all good looking. Uh, <laughs> you too. Good. And thank Ch you. Chinese men, they, I mean, and, and, and Japanese men, you know, in, in, in Korea they say miguk for Americans, chungguk for Chinese, togil. And uh, what, what is that? The Togo is, is Germany. Germany and, and Japanese are Ilban. Ilban, yeah. Well, only the Germans and Japanese are different. Everybody else is something uh, Gil. Yep. You know, so, but I mean, I, and I lived in Japan for a few years too. When did you arrive in Korea and how? 12 February 1969 on a Northwest contract flight. 69. 1969, 12 February. I had uh, stopped at Wake Island to refuel, landed at about 11 at night. It was cold, windy, and raining. And we flew through a terrible storm, which you can read more about in this book. Yeah, we'll talk about that yeah. later. But did you fly? Yes. Oh, well, yeah. Everybody, by then, everyone was flying. Did Two years fly? earlier, people were still going by boat. I arrived at Kimple. Nothing like it is today. Old-fashioned airplanes on the ground, a lot of piston stuff. Quad 50 machine guns all around the perimeter. And they were serious. And the Korean, the Rock Army manning those did not have a sense of humor. Right. They were serious men, and I, and I learned that right away. Did you know about the Korean War? Yes. Mostly from TV movies, uh, one starring, Ash. no, no, not that <laughs> nonsense. Uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, Men at War, I think, was Aldo Ray and Robert Ryan, and they followed uh, a squad of men into, they were up in North Korea at the time. And uh, yeah, I'm, uh, it, it intrigued me, but I didn't really learn anything about it. But I didn't like those no good commies after watching the movie. I didn't. But you know, I was I was still young when I saw that in high school. And I uh, I didn't really learn a lot about Korea until I got there, and then I became a sponge. I never I never mastered the language, though I do now have Pim Slur language at home for nine hundred bucks. So hopefully I can do that now. My daughters speak. Korean fluently. We're going to, I'm going to ask you detail about your duties and service yes. in Korea, but before I get into the detail, you said 69, so it's about 45 years. Yes. Have you ever imagined that you're going to be end up in Korea, a country that you really not knew much about? And Korean 
takes a little pondering. I guess Korea to me means Kim Chun Jao, my wife's maiden name. Yeah, that was her maiden name. Right. And uh, I didn't meet her. Uh, well, I got to Korea on 12 February 69, and I set about learning my new job. And it wasn't too long after that the EC-121 was shot down by North Korea. And uh, then I learned something about mobilization. Because uh, the day that was shot down, and I, I can't recall the date. EC-121. EC-121, it's three-tailed constellation. Yeah. 31 people were killed aboard. Anyway, I was up on something called Operation Central 71, which was a where air defense wars are fought. My unit was the 2nd Battalion Hawk 71st Air Defense Artillery. 71? 71st Air Defense Artillery. And it was headquartered at Camp Red Cloud. Well, the, I was on the hill when that airplane was shot down. And, went, and I was monitoring our radio nets, and I heard people calling in artillery. What that ended up being, and made my heart skip a little bit, was people, it was radio skip from Vietnam. We're listening to battle calls over FM radio all the way from Vietnam. Uh, after that was clarified in 15, 20 minutes, we were called to get off the site, come down to the headquarters, because I-Corps I had just uh, declared DEFCON 2. And the general at the time was General Yarrow Burrow. I think that's Y-A-R-L-B-O. R O U G H L bro, and uh, I, w I went I went down into the site, into the Tactical Operations Center at Camp Red Cloud, and uh, where was it? Camp Red Cloud. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Yeah. And uh, I, I went down to my headquarters and I was sent over to the Tactical Operations Center of the First U.S. Corps. And General Yarborough came in, and they had like 40 or 50 colonels in there. And, I mean, the Rock Army was there, the Rock Marines were everybody was there. And he had just come from, I think it was a Sunday, because he had just come from church. He was in a suit. Do you remember when was that shut down, the day? No, it's in, it's in here. Month. No. I do not remember. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, but uh, anyway, I was told to go over there and... Uh, be the representative for air defense. Uh -huh. Now, at a, at a Corps headquarters, a battalion, it's almost kind of silly to be represented, but we were the only air defense missile unit, so we were. De they demanded we have a rep there, and I was there. Second lieutenant, didn't know too much, but I knew this was serious. Anyway, General Yarbrough walked in. The room was buzzing, and when he walked in, somebody called attention and was dead silent. You could hear a pin hit. And he walked up and sat down. He said, okay, what's going on? And then uh, the G1, G2, 3, 4, uh, and so on and so forth rattled through their briefing, showed them a bunch of slides, had some maps, and then they sat, and it got quiet again. And then he, he stood up, and they had this large map on the wall. And he went over to the map, and he put his finger on one point, and he said, move second division here. And then he turned around, walked out, and they called attention again. And that was a few words that ended up being, for the next week, just incredible movement. I mean, rapidly, by flash message, it was sent throughout, throughout the Korea. And the Rock so Army... Where, 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 does, where do you want to have... You know, I don't know, but that's probably in the archive someplace. Okay. And, 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 yeah, I think it was 2nd Division. They were at Camp Casey, so they're going to move up online further. But Camp Casey's kind of online already. But what, we, what the uh, Rock Army did, and, and these are numbers, they may not be accurate. I remember someone saying that in the first week, a half a million troops were moved up online, and in the next month, or uh, maybe the next three weeks, almost 2 million more home guard or reserves rock army were brought up i mean i sat outside camp red cloud and i saw trucks going by morning noon and night loaded with soldiers shortly after that that i met kim chun jai 
I was a Signal Corps officer for a second of 71st, but unlike most, I didn't spend 13 months there. I spent almost 48 months. After, you know, I had a little medevac, but so I mean, I really got to learn how 8th Army worked. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's not embarrassing at all. What I there was a, a civilian club from Camp, from Camp Red Cloud. There was a little compound south west. It was called Camp Falling Water, mm -hmm. and on Camp Falling Water was the First Corps Engineer Headquarters, and on that base was something called the Civilian Club, and it was chartered with I Corps approval, the commander's approval before I got there, and five, ten years before I got there. And that club was supported by defense contractors and civil servants, so it was a civilian club. And uh, it, it, it was really the best club. Of, I saw Patty Kim there for the first time, and they had to reach deep in their pro pockets to get her there, let me tell you. But anyway, uh, I, I went down there with a friend, a, a second lieutenant that came in the day the EC-121 was shot down. And uh, and uh, this, you know, a few, a week or two weeks later, we just went down to the club. And I said, "You got to see this club. The place is great." So we went down there and we sat at a table, and we're sitting there. It was kind of quiet. I think it was like Friday night, and we were happy because the uh, I Corps alert was over. Then they're winding things down. Anyway, uh, the back of the club, the front of the club faced the main street in Wijambu, and the back of the club was on the compound. And oddly, the entrance was at the back. So we had to take a PX taxi to get in there. We went in, sat down. We were there 20 minutes, young lieutenants throwing down the beers. And then I noticed the door open in the back, the entrance, and two girls walked in. It was dark back there, and then they came in a little bit further. And it was just, uh, my eyes riveted on this. I mean, I saw this girl that looked like she was made out of porcelain or something. I mean, and she was conservatively dressed, and that was Shunja. And uh, she walked in, and every head in the place was following her. And uh, she had a girlfriend with her, and they were talking back together, taking measure of the place, I guess. And uh, she kind of frowned when she heard what her girlfriend said, and then it changed her smile, and they proceeded inside, and then they sat down. And I was with John, and I said, I'm going to go over and meet her. i got to see this girl. That's it. And I got up and walked over, butterflies in my stomach. I was kind of nervous. I thought, God, she probably won't even talk to me. And But, you know, I introduced myself, and she, and she said, I miss Kim. That's how she, and, and, I, and I was just elated. She answered me. And I looked back at my table and said, would you girls, ladies, care to join us? I've got my friend John here, and I see you have another lady. And they conferred again. I thought she's going to say, hell no, we don't. But she, but she said, yes, and, and this is uh, Miss Lee. Anyway, she offered her arm, and I was in seventh heaven, and that was the beginning. The second fascination was the Asian woman. Oh, yeah, but this was more than that. You mentioned the Chinese woman. Yeah, so this was like getting hit by a hammer right between the eyes, and it has never changed. And we got married about two, two and a half years later. I mean, the Army doesn't want, the Army at the time had an unwritten policy, you don't marry these foreigners. Right? Really? Oh, yeah. The unwritten policy. So you had to go through this nut so roll. Oh, yeah. But what isn't? <laughs> but, uh, you know, I. Anyway, but we had to go through this but process. What, were you, what was she doing there? What was well, she, she just came down to maybe meet a man. I don't know. I mean, she was with a girl, and she, I'd never seen her before. Of course, I'd only been there a dozen times. Yeah, she spoke a pretty good English. She did. Her girl, her girlfriend didn't speak much English, but there's more history to, to her background than that. But she was just kind of down there, and, and uh, then I uh, told her at the end of the night, John and I got a PX taxi and we drove her home. She was about half. She lived in a small house be halfway between Camp Red Cloud and Camp Falling Water. And halfway up there, when you're going towards Red Cloud, was the 128th Aviation. They had runways like this. And she lived across in a back street in one of the runways in an all-brick three-bedroom house that she had bought. 
So anyway, I, uh, we dropped her off, and I just asked her, could I see you again? And she said, yes. She said, and broke in English, yes, I have a good time tonight. Thank you, you gentlemen. And I said, when can I see you again? Maybe next Saturday we go show, officer club? I said, yep. And then we did that until we left, until I finally left Korea in November, I mean, in, uh, well, the last time I was there in November 1974. In uh, 1971, that's, that's how long it took. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, my, my marriage packet was an inch thick, and we went down to the embassy in Seoul, and uh, they stamped it, and the guy said, raise your right hand. I had her raise her right hand. She said a bunch of things and swore to things she couldn't begin to understand, and they go, boom, 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 you're married. Now take this across the street to the office marked the mayor, special city of Seoul, they'll do the same thing, and that's it. So the army changed the policy allowing soldiers to marry into foreign Well, I mean, they, they, they didn't, they never had a policy against it, but especially for officers, they didn't, they didn't want you fraternizing with local nationals. And so how did you do it? I just did it. I didn't give a goddamn what the army did. Yeah, that's right. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. What? She was quiet, yeah, which uh, is usually a cover for a very bright mind. And then she was, as a young man, she was physically one of the most beautiful women I have ever to this day seen. Clean complexion, porcelain white teeth, demure, quiet, gentle, and very conservative. Didn't her family? Of course. <laughs> a young nun, a goddamn foreigner, you bet. I mean, but they didn't say it. Very, I mean, they were very kind. And all, her family then only consisted of a half-brother and her mother because her dad died tragically in 1954, 50 months after the Korean War ended. And she was farmed out to a, a couple that came to help her mother out. They knew her mother would need help. And, you know, girls weren't worth much in those days as far as, uh, posterity, but young men were. I mean, they were, they worked uh, this age-old purpose of uh, providing a retirement. But uh, her, I, I finally met her mother uh, in 1973, and we got along famously after that. Good. You know, I just assured her. I said, you know, I'm not, not as horrible as you might think. I mean, you know, I, and that, is that racism? No, none of it. That's a culture. It's an ancient culture. Right. I mean, my, my brethren were swinging in trees in Europe when Korea had kingdoms. Yeah, Korea is one of the most closer Christians. Yeah, it is. Among, among its institutions. Uh, well, I was lucky. I got to see them go from poverty to riches through their own efforts. You brought a book with him. You wrote it, right? Yes. This is the experience of uh, young soldiers in Korea during that period of time. Part of it is uh, sort of an expose to behavior many of them would never indulge in at home. And behavior today that would not be tolerated for a minute in Korea, especially by Koreans. But, you know, we're coming in the early 1970s. Uh, was a tough time for Korea. So that's, that's what it's about. It's one man's. Talking about Kim Jong-il? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I do talk about her in here. Da, 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 da. That's Chun Ja. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, see, yeah. 30 January 2010, mm. about five years ago. You said you left Korea when? I uh, PCS from Korea, the permanent change of station, on 15 May 1972, I went down to Okinawa. But I would come back to Korea in 1973, 
1974 several times. And I would do that on what they call a temporary duty basis, TDY basis. And I, I worked in Okinawa with the U.S. Army Strategic Communications Command. I was a company commander there and I was also the adjutant. And I would work with the 1st Signal Brigade in Korea in that regard. When did you discharge from the military? Uh, 25 July 1975 was my last active duty day. And then I went into the reserves at where I remain today. I mean, I'm in the retired reserve because I'm an old duffer. Have you been back to Korea since 1994, I was the chief of the resources division and the director of communications for headquarters Pacific Air Forces. And I went to Air, Osan Air Force Base. They had something called the Osan, uh, Osan Communication uh, Command and Control Facility, the OCCF, and the Hardened Tactical, HTAC, Hardened Tactical Operations Center. And uh, in the book I'm writing now, I talk about the and fellow soldiers that were with me, staff officers that knew me in Red Cloud and Osan, and throughout the country, actually, because we had units all over the peninsula. We saw Korean men and women doing what others might consider menial work, uh, labor, hauling carts full of kindling, carrying kindling on their back. Dummies who hadn't been in country long thought that was amusing. But we saw something else, me and my fellows. We saw people that were doing what had to be done, and they were taking care of their families. And this included the young and the old men and women. And our conclusion was that these people account for the success of Korea today. They did all the heavy lifting by not complaining. And I, I never heard complaining, and that's almost a religious thing with me. I never heard complaining from those people, and I was around them all the time. And uh, that's why I developed such a deep respect for them. And, you know, and it just made me love my wife even more. I mean, she, she was just like them. She was tenacious and always doing something. So the reason, that's why Korea is successful today. Again, you got a, there's a homogeneity in the population, a real drive, honesty. And, you know, when I got there in 1969, what's that, 15, 16 years after the war, I knew that this country was going places. And by God, you know, I stayed in Okinawa and I, I saw it. And when I went back in 1994, I was, I, I was not astounded, but I didn't think it would come so fast because it was like going to another planet. I, I was at Osan, and I, we landed at Kempo in 94 and went down to Osan, coming back. I saw all these buildings, high rises to my right, which would have been in the east. And I said, "What?" You know, I asked. I asked the driver, "What? What the hell is that?" And he said, "It's a whole new city." I said, "Well, who? It, 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 I don't see any people." And he said, "Well, they're not there yet, but they're going to be." And what they were doing is they were doing some modernization program, moving people out of Seoul into there. And it's all voluntary, but it also makes a lot of sense. I haven't followed up on that, but I mean, it was phenomenal. They're going to move one million people into this. And I thought, well, that doesn't surprise me. These people, are, they're, they're going to keep going. I mean, look now, Samsung is probably going to bury Apple. As a historian, why do you think that the Korean War has been regarded as the Japanese United States? Well, it's the American Academy, the, 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 the public school system. Public schools, uh, K through 12, and the universities are kind of hostile to uh, history. You know, they want to rewrite it. <laughs> but they talk about Vietnam War, World War II, and other wars, but Korean War is just one paragraph. Well, I mean, but in, in, in when you say they talk about the other wars, Korea, Vietnam and uh, Korea, I mean, uh, World War II. Yeah. I, I, I'm not so sure what they're talking about. I, I uh, as Xenophon said 3,000 years ago, beware of the professors. I think uh, the Korean War has just been shunted aside, but I don't know why. I guess I can tell you that. Actually, the Korean War defined from June 25th of 1950 to January 31st of 1955, even though the armistice was signed on July 27th of 1952. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, federal in, uh, government expenditure so that small soldiers can be benefited out of, out of their service in the country. Since then, 2,000, 30,000, I mean 20,000, 30,000, and sometimes 50,000 U.S. soldiers have been stationed in Korea. Yeah. They were critical for the safety and security of the South Korea. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, when they come to United, I mean Korea, they come up with uh, technologies and knowledges in different sections, medical, you know, mm-hmm. engineering, personnel management, all these things that need to be Korean. And I, in my opinion, that's been very critical for the modernization and development of uh, South Korea as it is. It's not been really talked a lot. And I know that JUSTMEX, the Joint U.S. Military Advisory Advisor, Group, mm-hmm. hey, Right. And I, I really want to re-illuminate the role that they play, the contribution they made to Korea, what it is. And are you aware of any other approaches on that or any literature about it? Well, I think I, I can look into that for you. I mean, I, I know that when I got there, 60,000 troops, and then the uh, second... One of the divisions left, either the second or seventh, I can never keep it straight. That brought down to 40,000. Nun Warner Act in the, the mid to late 80s brought it down to present 28,000. Uh, I remember, though, when I got to Korea driving down the Kimpo to Seoul Highway, I remember Control Data had huge facilities over there. They, they were Control Data was a Minnesota company kind of like IBM at the time and uh, and I know IBM had facilities there so I mean and a lot of young women especially were working there doing assembly and all that but you know I Koreans are you know as I said again and I'm here I'm lecturing to a Korean they have one language one culture their, 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 their homogeneity is an advantage and uh, these people, these youngsters that were working there, were fascinated by what they saw, and they started learning about it. And they learned very quickly, because they, you know, again, they're all the same people. And uh, but I, I remember that it was like five or six stories, and it was a city block long, and maybe half a city block wide. It was a huge facility. I just, I was a country boy from Minnesota, living in the cornfields west of Minneapolis. I had never imagined that sort of high technology investment in Korea by controlled data at the time. Yeah, you talk. I'm more interested in how the U.S. forces in Korea contributed to the development of Korea. Well, I can tell you one thing, one thing through the military anyway, in my limited experience, in... Uh, I think maybe 19, late 1970, we turned over a Hawk missile battalion to the Korean Army, the Rock Army, and that it was at Chuncheon. The missile battalion's designation was Seventh uh, Battalion, Fifth Artillery, and it was a Hawk missile battalion. And we did that. When we did that, we had to uh, take our old radio equipment, which was time division multiplex, you know, vacuum tubes and that. We had to make sure it was perfect. And I had people that were very good at making sure things were perfect. So when we turned them over to the Koreans, they didn't get junk. So, I mean, I was there, and we turned an entire battalion over to the Koreans. And on the heels of that, the Army decided in the Hawk missile system to digitize and get rid of the old analog systems. So we got something called the Angry 103 radio, and we started replacing all of our old uh, frequency division multiplex, the analog stuff, and we kept sending that to the Koreans. And then, but the Koreans were very interested in the digital because it was just better. The problem if with uh, old vacuum tube technology is Korea gets hot summers, winters are wonderful, but the, the tubes start popping and you can lose communication. So, I mean, I, I conducted classes 
I was given that responsibility by our brigade commander, who was a one-star general, and he worked for the uh, deputy commander of 8th Army. He was a three-star. And, uh, and I think it was uh, Michaelis was the 8th Army commander. And I knew these men. I mean, I was very unusual, but I was fortunate to know them. I got a medal from that last guy. Uh, but the Koreans were fast learners, but they some they already had books on these things. So I mean, you know, I mean, going from analog to digital is like going from smoke signals to telephones, Absolutely. you know. And you know where the Koreans are today digitally, so you're right. Uh, and that was in, as I say, late 1970. And uh, I mean, digital was new to me at the time. You know, and I just came out of the signal school at Fort Gordon, Georgia. They called the U.S. Army Southeastern Signal School, which was supposed to be the cutting edge of the world. When did you move to Hawaii? I came here out of the Pentagon on September of 1990. I was at the, with, on the air staff. I joined the air staff and the director of communications up there. I worked for and know to this day many, many general officers in that business. My pleasure. Sharing your stories with me. This interview will be preserved in the Korean War Veterans Digital Memorial. I'm going to create a section under that banner for U.S. forces in Korea. Okay. They are the Korea Veterans of America, and I think that they need to be recognized. I agree. As Korean War Veterans, too. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Doctor.